Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, and it's time for the seventh and final lecture of my series on the gross pathology of mice and rats, and we're going to cover the remaining systems of the rat, including the urinary, nervous, reproductive, and integumentary systems. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have shaped this field of veterinary pathology, as well have been so kind to share their images over the years. First, let's talk about the integumentary system of the rat. Here's a rat with bilaterally symmetrical areas of ulceration, necrosis, and hair loss over the shoulders. When we talked about uh, dermatitis in B6 mice, it was uh, a, a wide range of various factors. In rats, it's uh, a lot more simple. This is acute ulcerative dermatitis, and it's usually uh, coexisting with infection by Staphylococcus species, which are ubiquitous in the environment, either Staph aureus, which is the vast majority of cases. Occasionally, Staph xylosis can be, can be isolated from these ulcers. Pretty much always starts with trauma, whether it's self-trauma, whether it's fighting trauma. Um, this is not an uncommon finding in rats, and uh, the incidence of dermatitis ranges from 1 to 20 percent, depending on the uh, rat population. As you can imagine, the uh, lesions can be more severe in animals who are immunocompromised, and uh, you can actually see them in uh, in rats who overly self-groom. So it starts with trauma, infected with staph, and this is what you get. Here's a lesion in a young rat that we uh, saw in association uh, with mice as well. In rats, it is also called ringtail. The classic uh, cause is low environmental humidity and a low environmental temperature. There are a couple of other possibilities. Genetics probably has something significant to do with this. Hydration status, nutritional state, all may play a role. Um, putting animals in, uh, in cottony bedding. Sometimes uh, a young rat pups are housed in something with the cotton and strings, and they could occasionally uh, constrict uh, around the end of the tail cause these lesions. A repeated blood draws from the uh, tail of rats has been identified also as uh, as potential cause. And there was an excellent paper written last year in mice, which suggests that this may simply be a very localized cornification defect in which uh, deficient corn, uh, cornification results in a lack of proper shedding of the epidermis in these regional areas, and they form uh, constriction bands along the tail. So a lot of uh, classic causes and uh, I would uh, consider the combination of low environmental humidity and high temperature, which is, which is written in all of the textbooks, to be my test answer until definitively proven otherwise. Here's a classic lesion in uh, rats. If you look, take a good look at the ear pinna, you'll see that it is sort of uh, lumpy, bumpy. There are nodules within it. Um, there is swelling to the point that uh, you don't have the normal uh, concavity and the, uh, the horizontal uh, canal appears to be somewhat compromised. This is a, uh, a disease known as auricular chondritis, and it's most common in, in spray dolly and wistars, and uh, it's likely an immune-mediated cartilage degeneration, but the true pathogenesis is not really known. Uh, metal tags have been incriminated, but a lot of non-tag animals have it too. So uh, the you know superimposition and crunching of the cartilage um, with release of antigens and the presence of metal may actually simply worsen this particular disease. Uh, one of the uh, histologic lesions that you'll see is splitting initially of the pinnal cartilage plate, and. Uh, it leads to exposure of antigens, inflammation, and uh, the, a proliferation of the perichondrium, which may differentiate further into uh, additional chondrocytes. 
when the lesions fully develop, the ears are misshapen. They contain firm nodules, but there, usually there's no evidence of pain on palpation. There are, is a similar condition in humans and cats known as relapsing polychondritis. Um, and in these animals and people, they do have circulating antibodies to type 2 collagen. So once again, auricular chondritis likely immune mediated and uh, pathogenesis not totally worked out in rats. Oh, here's a classic. Um, if it is a mass underneath the ear until proven otherwise, it is a Zimbel's gland tumor. People use the term Zimbel's gland uh, adenomas and adenocarcinomas. I don't generally use it. These things tend not to metastasize. They may be locally invasive and they always look malignant. The Zimbel's gland is a modified and combined uh, squamous and sebaceous gland underneath the ear and both, either or both, of the components can uh, become neoplastic and they tend to become really, really bizarre looking. But they don't generally uh, generally metastasize anywhere. I, I usually use the term Zimbel's gland tumor to fall somewhere in the middle of that. Uh, people will use the term Zimbel's gland hyperplasia uh, Zimple's gland adenoma and carcinoma as sort of a spectrum, but I'm not sure if there's a precise definition as to what is hyperplasia and what is uh, adenoma. The, uh, the Zimple's gland is, is normally composed of three to four triangular lobules of, of sebaceous morphology, and they empty um, into a place near the tympanic membrane. Nobody really knows what this duct does, but it certainly does give rise to more than a share of tumors, and it's a classic tumor and a classic location in the rat. So you absolutely want to know this one. Uh, not terribly common. Uh, skin tumor in the rat is a Corrado acanthoma. It looks very much like an intracutaneous cornifying epithelioma or cutaneous acanthoma in a, in a dog um, where you have often a central pore with a complex wall and a tremendous amount of keratin. Uh, keratin. There, this, has been, uh, this has been caused by a number of, uh, of carcinogens uh, including anthracene and azo dyes um, and can spontaneously be seen in aging rats. Oh, here's a funny looking rat. Almost looks like a hedgehog. All the hairs are standing. And if you, if you felt this animal, um, it would be crunchy, like like uh, uh, Rice Krispies or or like wrapping paper. And this is simply a case of widespread subcutaneous emphysema in this rat, and in any other rats that look like this, and any species that look like this. Uh, whether it's a cat or a dog, I'm going to think about airway trauma. When there is trauma, especially to the lower airway in terms of the, uh, the trachea um, or the very uh, initial reaches of the bronchi, um, if you have a puncture and release of air, it's going to trickle out and it's going to accumulate within the subcutaneous tissue. The animals uh, are not painful. However, if there's a tremendous amount, you get really tight skin, makes it very difficult um, for the animal to breathe, even on top of the fact that some of the air is coming back out. Okay, look at, let's look at the endocrine system of rats, and here is a big hemorrhagic neoplasm in the area of the hypothalamus. We've talked about this with all the other lab animals. We will talk about it with more lab animal species when we get to them. This is an adenoma of the pars distalis of the pituitary. And luckily for us, all lab animals uh, happen to all secrete prolactin. They do not generally secrete cortisol or anything else like that. Uh, size is very important. There's no really precise um, delineation for this very common tumor in older Sprague Dolly and Wistar rats. Um, so 
just the ones that, that uh, even compression is not a really good sign. So I, I go to classics with metastasis or really aggressive infiltration. But I would maybe on, on a gross aspect, I might because this is so large, it looks like it's compressing, I may be tempted to go carcinoma. But uh, just not really a lot of good guidance out there as to what's, what is a m adenoma or carcinoma. And of course you have microadenomas, which are the ones that you pick up uh, with the microscope, but you cannot see them grossly. Occasionally you'll see an animal with, uh, uh, with mammary hyperplasia. And there have been a number of papers which suggested that these tumors are related to the high incidence of fibroadenomas in rats. Uh, even a recent uh, uh, case in the Wednesday slide conference within the last five years had a rat with a pituitary adenoma and mammary hyperplasia and made that connection. Just one from a side showing the classic hypothalamus. I'm sure these animals have, uh, have tremendous headache. They could show signs of cortical blindness um, if the or signs of blindness if it compresses the optic nerve and causes atrophy. Um, but unlike uh, what we see in horses, they don't get uh, they don't become polyuric, polydipsic. They don't um, they generally don't have long hair coats or something like that. That's more of a horse thing. Uh, follicular adenoma. Um, It'd be great to have a good model for follicular adenomas and adenocarcinomas because that's a very, very common tumor in humans. And we've been working toward that. Certainly some of the transgenic mouse and rat models um, are getting very close to that. Um, classically, they've been induced by uh, a number of drugs in uh, thyroid adenoma associated lines of rats, including simvastatin and uh, even localized radiation. Uh, many old rats um, this may be a component of multiple endocrine neoplasms, uh, adrenal cortical, uh, sorry, adrenal medullary tumors of fear chromocytomas are very, very, very common in rats. They're like one of the top uh, two or three species. Um, and then you often will have a number of other neoplasms, including uh, these follicular adenomas, C cell adenomas, adenomas of the pituitary gland, which we just looked at, even islet cell tumors. So two or three, um, you mix and match them, and there are various syndromes associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia. Here's a little islet cell tumor, um, generally in the area of the pancreas, and they are red. Um, they may or may not be, uh, may or may not be uh, functional. If they are, then they are secreting inter e either intermittently or eventually a steady state form of uh, uh, insulin. So the animals will be hypoglycemic. They'll have diminished mentation. And if they seizure for a long time, which they may go into, um, you may see laminar necrosis in the brain. Um, they've been seen in increased numbers in uh, a number of different uh, uh, chemicals, uh, including streptozotocin, uh, pyrolizidine alkaloids, or radiation. And rats are somewhat unique in that they may be associated with peripheral neuropathy, which is sort of a twist on the, the typical insulinoma findings. Well, you knew it was coming. Here it is. It's a medullary tumor. It's a pheochromocytoma. This one has a little tiny uh, uh, adrenal cortical adenoma, and that's very common too. But a huge, um, there's a, a huge medullary tumor or pheochromocytoma. Uh, very, 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 very rarely clinically active. Usually they are just incidental findings. The literature says that. Uh, Unlike, uh, unlike other species, rats actually have three different types of cells within the medulla. They have the epinephrine secreting cells, norepinephrine secreting cells, and some small granule containing cells. Um, nobody really seems to know that much about. They don't seem to give rise to tumors. Eventually someone's going to come up with the right stay and say, ah, I know what those is. Or maybe it's a primitive or pluripotent cell, but you'll hear that term occasionally, these small granule containing cells. Okay, 
moving on to the urinary system. This is a classic, classic, classic appearance of a, a very, very common disease, especially of in-brain strains, strains of mice. And there, in almost every species, the kidneys should be a very traditionally um, rich brownish red color due to the vascularity, of course. And when the kidneys become sort of this golden granular appearance, you want to think about glomerulonephritis. And in rats, rats are the prototypical species for a condition known as uh, chronic progressive nephropathy. It's the most common renal disease in aged laboratory rats. And the lesions, uh, for people who are really good at picking up the very early lesions, they can see them as, as young as two or three months. And they start out with changes in the, uh, the color of the tubules and then you have some tubular epithelial changes. You eventually will have tubular epithelial necrosis and loss and fibrosis. Over time, because you can't do anything to the tubules and not eventually hurt the glomeruli and vice versa, damage to one part of the nephron ultimately is going to result in damage to the rest of the nephron. And I consider the interstitium part of the nephron as well. So you get changes in the interstitium, like fibrosis and inflammation. So this is a chronic progressive nephropathy. The other concept is all old rodents eventually have terrible kidneys. Uh, the aging changes in, in rodent kidneys are, you know, are just classic, and every type of rodent has their own somewhat specific little twist on it. But when you think of uh, rats are the ones that everyone else is measured against. So you're going to see changes at this point in this old rat. You're going to see massive changes um, in the glomeruli as well as glomerular sclerosis. You're going to see massive loss of tubules, tubular ectasia, tubular proteinosis, extensive areas of, of fibrosis, and lymphoplasmocytic inflammation or chronic interstitial nephritis. Cause, genetics certainly is going to play a part. Diet seems to play a part. Uh, including uh, animals on a higher protein diet, a lower protein. Protein restriction um, really helps rats live a much longer life and contributes less to this. Um, males, male rats t tend to have a, uh, a higher incidence or at least an accelerant development of something like this, although prolactin, a prolactin screening pituitary gland has been reported to uh, potentiate and uh, and uh, accelerate this d disease. Other things you can do to accelerate it would be to take out one kidney, irradiate the animal, do thymectomies, or, or give thyroid or thyroxin. There's people have done all sorts of things to see the effect on the kidneys. Obviously, this is going to be a significant complicating factor um, when we are doing research on the kidneys in rats. And so chronic studies in, in rat urinary tract disease can be fraught with complication due to the presence of this particular. Know this gross lesion. It's a great one. Nothing else looks like this. Chronic progressive nephropathy. This is cut section of that. You can see the granularity here. The, the uh, change in color due to the extensive fibrosis and, uh, and inflammation. You can even see the ectasia of some of these tubules um, within the medulla that uh, uh, you should not see. There's also a degree of hydronephrosis and this white area in the pelvis suggests that there is, uh, there is renal pelvic necrosis. Remember anytime you get something that increases the blood pressure the, or the pressure within the medulla, like the fibrosis that's associated with this condition, you're going to get ischemia to the papilla because the vasorector are wimpy little vessels that will close for almost no reason at all. So you commonly will see a degree of papillary necrosis and, and hydronephrosis in advanced cases of chronic progressive nephropathy. Oh, a nice picture by Dr. Dean Percy. It's just multiple abscesses within the kidney, and this is due to Carinobacterium cuchari. Remember, everybody's got Carinobacterium cuchari. 
or at least every rodent, every rat, every mouse, and when you immunosuppress them for various reasons, because you want to infect them with another disease or, or any sorts of things, um, you run a pretty good risk of causing a generalized coronabacterium cuchari septicemia. It'll turn up in the lungs, the liver, the spleen, and the, uh, uh, and the kidneys all at once. They're abscesses, multiple sizes, multifocal to coalescing. Uh, differential diagnosis would probably be lymphoma, but in like in mice, rats with lymphoma can have a big liver, big spleen, generally huge, and so you want to look at that. But uh, this, these are just abscesses due to Carinobacterium cuchari. Okay, hemorrhagic cystitis, uh, unlike the mouse where it's often associated with retention of coagulated ejaculate, Usually, um, it's associated with urinary calculi in rats. Uh, remember that male rats, like male mice, um, tend to uh, they tend to be predisposed to uh, to calculus formation because they secrete a lot of extra protein in the urine, which often forms uh, a nidus for the accumulation of uh, mineral. Uh, Harlan Sprague Dolly rats. Um, tend to excrete um, a lot of calcium in their urine. And so they will have calcium phosphate containing precipitates, crystals, and uh, urolis at a somewhat higher rate than other strains of inbred rats. And here's some of those uh, really nice uh, uh, urolis. Um, uh, you can also see oxalates, they're very strain specific, ammonium, magnesium, phosphate, or struvite. That would be a good one. This one is actually trying to make himself an extra kidney here. And just one more um, uh, urolith in a rat. Oh, we're getting down closer to the end. Let's talk a little bit about the nervous system of the rat. Uh, this is a, a young pup, and there is multifocal cerebral and cerebellar hemorrhage and necrosis. Remember, we never say hemorrhage just by itself. There's usually always necrosis, especially in the brain. Usually, if this one usually affects rat pups or can be uh, infect animals in utero. And this is a parvovirus. Remember, parvoviruses cause uh, cerebral and especially cerebellar damage in, in cats and to a lesser extent in dogs, and it'll do the same thing in rats. There's a special one that attacks the brain and the scrotum. For odd reasons, uh, is its choice in organs to attack, but this one is called, it's got a great name, it's called Killam Rat Parvovirus. People will also call it rat virus. It's actually a proto-parvovirus, and remember, Parvoviruses are very selective in which organs they attack um, because they have their replication deficient. They need to hit um, cells in a particular stage of, of uh, development. So they'll hit the very immature brain and they will hit the, the uh, testes because oftentimes you're going to have cells in uh, various stages of development during uh, spermatogenesis, etc. The virus also will attack endothelial cells, which really gives it this nice uh, hemorrhage and necrosis character. Okay, um, whenever I see a cut section of the head like this where I'm looking at the, the maxilla and especially the ridges of the hard palate and just about any species, one of the things I'm going to look very carefully at is going to be the middle ear because it's a very difficult thing to demonstrate and so especially with rodents someone goes to the trouble to cut the skull like that it's usually because they're trying to demonstrate something going on the middle ear it should be dry there's a wet exudate within this and whenever i think about middle ear infections the top of my list in laboratory rodents is going to be the classic mycoplasma pulmonis. Mycoplasma pulmonis we've talked about before with the respiratory system and it wants nothing more out of life than to be a cilia. So you'll find it wherever a cilia is found in the body. You'll see it in the in the uh, in the lungs, 
in the airways of the lungs, you'll see it in the middle ear and the inner ear, and then you will see it in the reproductive tract of females because there are some cilia in there too. And uh, I would also probably have to consider a little further down my list um, a couple of other etiologies. Uh, carbacillus or cilia associated respiratory bacillus will be in there because there's cilia. And then there's a couple of opportunists which may turn up uh, in the uh, middle ear, uh, including Pasteurella pneumotropica, a very common um, abscess forming uh, opportunist in mice and rats. This is usually an ascending infection, at least in the case of mycoplasma or carbacillus. It's an ascending infection because it gets into the nasal cavity, and then there will be an ascending infection via the eustachian tubes. And it can, following perforation of the tympanum, also um, get into the middle ear. But usually, um, it is due to arising from the eustachian tubes. Is this animal going to have a head tilt? Well, right now, no, if it's confined to the middle ear. Remember that the head tilts are only associated with otitis interna. But uh, they will spread, obviously, from the middle ear into the uh, inner ear. So that's something to be think about. Um, you can, it's amazing how long these animals will harbor these infections, the changes that you will see in terms of fibrosis and uh, lysis of the bones in the middle ear and actual remodeling of the bone of the tympanic bulla. So sometimes you can see some absolutely amazing things. If you're working in a laboratory, you may never see mycoplasma pulmonis. But if you want to see one, go to your local PetSmart or Petco and get a couple of their rats, and I guarantee you are going to see that. Uh, nervous system, we got to cover the eyes, and we have hemorrhage, probably a small uh, corneal uh, ulcer. Majority of these are traumatic, don't put your male rats together, um, but it also may be associated, we've talked about sialodacryo adenitis virus and damage to the lacrimal glands, especially the big hardarian gland in the back of the eye, which supplies a lot of the tears, and you can just have dry eye and formation of, the, uh, of an ulcer. Um, or uh, corneal injury, trauma from cages, and let's not forget the effects of ammonia on the cornea resulting in uh, a sort of calcification and ulceration of the central cornea, which is the most sensitive and also the most exposed to high levels. And we're looking at a cross-section through the back of the eye, and you can see uh, we're behind the eyes, and you can see that this is a somewhat normal uh, hardarian gland, except for this spot here. This is fairly normal looking. And then this other side, there's a tremendous amount of hemorrhage and necrosis and edema. Um, so this would be what we th would see with the coronavirus that causes sialodacryo adenitis. Cataracts. Bilateral cataracts, there's an, there is a genetic model called the ICR rat, or the inherited cataract uh, rat model. We used to, have to do all sorts of terrible things to these animals, irradiate them, put them very up high up in the uh, uh, near constant light source. We'd blow out their retinas and also generally cause damage in the lens as well. You can also induce this by feeding lactose-containing diets. Um, the lens gets all of its all of its nutrients from the aqueous humor. There's no blood vessels in the lens. So if you have too much sugar in the aqueous humor, whether it is glucose or galactose, it will be absorbed by the lens. It will go into the uh, hexose monophosphate shunt. And it generally, at the level of sorbitol dehydrogenase, will back up because there's never enough SDH. And so you'll get an accumulation of sorbitol, which is still a sugar, and high levels of sorbitol within the lens waiting to uh, get broken down um, will bring water into the lens, resulting in lens uh, swelling and cataract formation. It's not only the, this is not only the cause of, of cataracts in research, this is also the classic cause of diabetic cataracts, with glucose being the uh, very high uh, level and just can't be metabolized by the limited capability of the lens. 
hey, let's finish this uh, lecture up with a reproductive system in the rats. Um, here we are, it's a great picture by Dean Percy, and it's a, a fantastic picture of one of the horns of the uterus, and we have a uh, we have a focal swelling. If we open that up, it might. Oops, I don't have a picture. I'm sorry. If we open that up, it's just going to look like a suppurative endometritis, and this is the third manifestation of mycoplasma pulmonis, due to the fact that there's some cilia, especially in the oviducts, and uh, it very characteristically will cause a pyometra in affected animals. Polyps, polyps in rats. They can uh, usually arise from the endometrial stroma. They can be endometrial. They can be epithelial, or they can be uh, polyps of the endometrial stroma. You cut into that, you see nothing but uterine stroma, the mesenchymal tissue, and they usually don't cause much of a problem. They could interfere with fertility um, if they get large, but uh, usually it's not much of a problem. These are just incidental findings, something that you will see all the time in rats. And this is a huge, terrible case. I say it's a rat uh, attached to a tumor. And this is a mammary tumor. In mice, they're usually retroviral-induced and malignant. In rats, they are not retroviral-induced, and they are usually benign. These are fibroadenomas. And histologically, they're a combination of uh, fibrous connective tissue, that's the fibro part, and usually functional glandular tissue, and, and the polygonal epithelial cells within the glandular tissue are going to be big, and they're going to have like milk vacuoles in them. Um, you can see it in uh, both male and female rats. You're not going to see mammary tumors in male rats because male mice have no functional mammary tissue, um, but rats do. So you can see these in male rats and, and female rats. Get to them early. They're easily surgical removal. They may or may not, as we previously said, be associated with pituitary adenomas, but there's nothing you're going to do surgically about a pituitary adenoma. You're just going to have to have to accept that. But the fibroadenomas can usually be, uh, be removed easily if they're identified. This one would be a pretty much of a trick uh, to get off, but most of them, they're hard. They're non-painful. And uh, they make these rats make for great surgical candidates. And this is just one from the inside. If it's a rat, it's a mammary tumor. I'm going fibroadenoma. Even I've, I don't even have a picture to look at. Ah, here's our killing rat parvovirus, an adult animal, and it's hitting the endothelium. There's probably not too much else that's going to hit in this animal, but it hits the endothelium very characteristically, causing hemorrhage and some necrosis in the testis and the tunics and the scrotum itself. Killam's rat parvovirus, one of my favorite pictures of this, showing that there is hemorrhage within the uh, uh, tunics, within the epididymis, a little bit within the testis, and in the, uh, in the scrotum itself. Um, this is a good one because you get to see the inclusions. You almost never get to see inclusions in parvovirus, but you get to see inclusions, um, and you get to see areas of infarction within the testis because you have thrombosis due to its attack on the endothelium. Okay, uh, the specialized sebaceous glands around the prepuce and the uh, and the vulva. These are known as the propucial and the clitoral glands, and they don't really do all that much except form tumors. And usually, to do that, you have to uh, you have to hit them with some sort of carcinogen. Uh, spontaneously, in very old rats, um, they tend to be fairly fairly low. Um, maybe Fisher 344s having 15%. And it goes down from there. Um, but it, they were always uh, ones that would be fairly responsive to the administration of carcinogens. For some reason, in a number of species, including ferrets, which aren't rodents, don't make that mistake, um, you'll upset them um, greatly. But uh, the, the glands around the prepuce and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the vulva tend to have a much higher rate of malignancies than uh, those on, for say, the, the head and the face and around the ears. But that's just an observation of mine, and I don't have too much more to say. There was a recent publication um, on a and clitoral gland adenocarcinomas in the dog, and that's something that I think a lot of people look 
oh, they overlook it, but it really is an entity and something to, uh, to be considered. Ah, suppurative prostatitis. Yes, uh, rats have a prostate gland. There is a, they are an animal model, inject a little bit of E. coli up to the urethra in the area of the prostate. And uh, occasionally you'll see this spontaneously associated with pyelonephritis as well, but it's not a common thing. It's more of a research type thing. We only have a couple more, um, and we're going to look at a very, very common tumor in old male rats, especially in Fisher 344s. We talked about a triad of tumors. This is number two, first tumor being the mononuclear cell leukemia. And Fisher 344 are great rats, and they're very friendly, but they do have this triad of tumors that uh, really makes them uh, much more difficult to work with in chronic studies because they always end up with these tumors and they complicate things. But we are looking at the testis, and we are looking through the unopened tunic here, and you don't have to open them up if you don't want to. We will in a sec, but uh, through here you can see these coalescing uh, white tumors, and this is a classic interstitial cell tumor, the most... Common neoplasm with the testis of the rat, as well as the dog. They are steroid producing, so when we take a look at them, they're probably going to be sort of yellowish orange with areas of hemorrhage and necrosis, which is very characteristic for interstitial cell tumors in most species. Um, the people who do toxpath work, um, they're very good at, at uh, saying, okay, this is uh, hyperplasia, this is adenoma. Um, they rarely, rarely, rarely tend to metastasize, but you know, they're just so common, approaching about 90% in uh, Fisher 344s, as, uh, um, as opposed to less than 10% in Wistars and almost never in Sprague Dolly. So it's just one of those things that, uh, unfortunately, uh, works against the Fisher 344. Rarely, rarely they've been associated with hypercalcemia. I've never seen one, but, uh, but it's been associated in the rat and when we do cut them in, this is probably a day's work in, uh, uh, in a lab that's doing maybe 20 animals a day. Um, and you can see that just like we see in the dog and cat, they are orange because they're steroid producing. The major, the major component of steroids is fat, and the fat is oxidized during the process. And traditionally, classically, whenever you break down fat, it's going to become a yellow-orange color, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, leukoencephalomalacia in a horse, steatitis in a cat or a mink. It always has this nice orange color. So you know you're dealing with fat in some form or fashion. This is these are classic interstitial cell tumors. And just to finish up, the triad of neoplasms in Fisher 344 rats, not an uncommon neoplasm in the rat, and uh, is a mesothelioma. Mesotheliomas can arise anywhere that there is mesothelium, so they're often seen in the uh, in the, the pleura, in the abdomen. This one has sort of gotten away from this animal, probably had a lot of ascites. Um, and they're a complicating factor. And another thing, place that they will pop up, because remember, the vaginal tunics are an extension of the peritoneum, so they can just either arise spontaneously within the uh, neoplasm or within the testis or they can crawl down the inguinal canal and uh, affect the tunics and as we look here as we just learned we're looking through the the unaffected tunic and here are our interstitial cell tumors and I would bet you and years ago the ACVP on their exam put a tumor uh, from from a probably a Fisher 344 rat um, which had not only these two tumors, but also, if you look closely in the vessels, you would see the mononuclear cell leukemia, a killer slide um, of three classic lesions, which pop up routinely in Fisher 344 and, and rarely in other strains of rats. Well, we almost hit 40 minutes on this, but this does bring our lectures on the mouse and rat to a close. Well, once again, I want to thank all my friends like Corey Braden and Crystal Pearl and, and Jerry Ward and all the people who have not only done so much in the field, but if you ever have a chance to uh, get them to come and lecture on mice and rats, uh, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to say pick them first. I will lecture on anything. I enjoy doing this, but they really know this stuff 
inside and out and especially when we get into mice it's a very very specialized field one that I just do not have the exposure to know all of the cutting edge stuff that these people not only know but they are involved in so with that uh, I think we'll move on to rabbits we're gonna hit all of the laboratory animal species uh, before the end of the year so we'll start rabbits in a day or two hey I hope you enjoyed these lectures on mice and rats I certainly have enjoyed uh, doing them for you and I hope you have a fantastic day